Good evening, everyone. Is this working? Can you hear me? No, it's not really working. Ah, that's better. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Judith Rose, Acting Director of Villa Albertine and Acting Cultural Counselor of the French Embassy in the US. It is a great honor for us at Villa Albertine to welcome Mohamed Mbougarsar and Julian Lucas for what I'm sure will be a captivating discussion about Mohamed's latest book, The Most Secret Memory of Men, La Plus Secrète Mémoire des Hommes, in French. Before starting the conversation, I'd like to briefly introduce our two speakers. Mohamed Mbougarsar was born in Dakar, Senegal in 1990. His first novel, Brotherhood, translated by Alexia Trigo and published by Europa Editions, won the 2015 Grand Prix du Roman Métis, the Prix Amadou Kuruma, and the French Voices Prize, Prize awarded by this embassy. In 2021, he became the first writer from Sub-Saharan Africa to be awarded France's most prestigious literary prize, the Prix Goncourt, for the novel that will be the focus of our conversation tonight, The Most Secret Memory of Man, translated into English by Lara Vergniaud and published a few weeks ago in the US by other press. To promote the American edition of his novel, Mohamed is currently on a major US tour, which began a few days ago in Atlanta and will continue in numerous cities. We are very honored that he has agreed to make a stop in New York to present his book at the Albertine Bookstore. To quote author and former Villa Albertine resident Leila Slimani, the most secret memory of man is a love letter to literature. It follows the story of a young Senegalese writer in Paris whose discovery of a legendary book from the 1930s and his search for its author <coughs> forces him to confront the great tragedies of history from colonialism to the Holocaust. Joining Mohamed Mbougarsar is Julian Lucas, staff writer at The New Yorker. Previously, Julian was an associate editor at Cabinet and a contributing editor at The Point. His articles have appeared in The New York Review of Books, Vanity Fair, Harper's Magazine, Art in America, and the New York Times Book Review, where he was a contributing writer. Finally, we'll have the honor of welcoming writer, editor, and professor at Duke University, Felwin Saar, at the end of the discussion, who will tell us about his relationship with Mohamed's text, which he co-edited in French. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the team at Mohamed M. Bougarsar's American Publishing House, Other Press, and in particular, Judith Gorevich and Jessica Greer, as well as the Villa Albertine and Albertine Bookstore teams who organized this event and Mohamed's tour. The discussion tonight will be followed by a short Q&A session. Thank you for your attention, and Mohamed, Julian, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, so, Mohammed, it's uh, it's such an honor to be speaking with you tonight. Um, I I still remember the first time I, I picked up your novel. I was at uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport and uh, just looking for something to read, and it blew me away immediately. But what really captured me about it was the the voice of your young narrator, uh, Diagan Latiofe, uh, who is sort of caught between this earnest, early 20s, uh, all-consuming passion for, for literature, which is really everything to him, uh, but also the difficulties of being a, a, a promising young African writer in Paris with all that that entails uh, insofar as the, the sort of metropolitan literary schema. And uh, I, I wanted to start by asking, you know, this book is far too complex and inventive to, to, to be described as, uh, as autofiction necessarily, but how much of this story was, was yours? How much of your experience as a young writer did you give to Diagan? Um, thank you, Julian, and good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to have this conversation. 
uh, in a way, uh, we started it uh, at Charles de Gaulle's, when, um, in a way. Uh, Charles de Gaulle's is um, often at the beginning of some story. Uh, <laughs> can say, Not always uh, a good one. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for welcoming me here. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a privilege to be here thanks to uh, La Villa Albertine and thanks to this uh, beautiful uh, bookstore. Um, it's very difficult to answer this, this question because I could say uh, it's fully, totally uh, my story uh, and it could be true. But I could also say nothing is from me and it could be uh, true as well. Um, what I can say to find a balance um, would just be that um, the questions, Jagan questions, are, are mine at the beginning. Uh, he has many questions, but I think we can just keep one, one question. And this question could be, um, what are we looking for in books? Uh, either we write them or read them. What are we looking for? Why do we have desire to read books? All start from there. And of course, uh, it's my question, but I'm sure it's yours. And I'm sure it's uh, the question of every people who just read and love reading, um, in a way. But uh, of course, in the book, Jagan have, has some um, very uh, um, flamboyant moment or very uh, um, amazing uh, um, defeat. I mean, uh, um, I, can't, I can't say that I have that kind of flamboyance and I can't accept to have those defeats. So that's why I let him as a, a total and independent character. Uh, speaking of those, that flamboyance and those defeats, you know, often in the novel he's accused by his, his lovers of uh, uh, trying to replace literature, uh, trying to replace life with literature. Uh, and, you know, maybe a, a better way to start talking about your career as a writer would be to say, so you, this was your fourth novel, and you've, you've written about everything from uh, the situation of migrants in Italy to Islamism in, in the Sahel to homosexuality and homophobia in Senegal. What made you decide to write a book about literature, uh, and how did you arrive at that? Yeah, um, I think that since the beginning, it was my obsession, literature. But of course, you can't start, I mean, at least, I, can't, I couldn't start uh, entering, uh, starting writing uh, and saying, my obsession is literature. I think that I had to write some other book. But I think, I feel that uh, my first novel is deeply about language. Uh, and about uh, the possibility of language facing power, facing uh, terror, terrorism. Um, and in Silence du Coeur, my second novel, you can find some characters uh, uh, who can be considered as prefiguration of Eliman. There is a lonely poet uh, named Fantini uh, in Silence du Coeur, and Giuseppe Fantini is uh, in a way uh, uh, Eliman's brother, is possible. And um, in the Purzam, uh, Ndenege, the main character, is a professor of literature. And of course, he is facing some issues in, so, uh, in the Senegalese society, but deep inside, uh, he faces them through literature, and his uh, tragedy starts with literature, because one day in classroom, 
uh, he quoted Verlaine, and the whole scandal starts with that quote. Uh, all of this just to say that from the beginning, I thought that the, the obsession was here, literature was here, but I had to find the form, the structure, um, and uh, just the, yeah, the opportunity. And the opportunity was, uh, in a way, my fascination, my obsession for Jan Bowel again. Uh, and I decided to, to start to write this, this book. But in a way, it's my first book, my first novel, mm. my first novel. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Olugem because that was my, my next question for you. So, so in the, the most secret memory of men, uh, Diagon's sort of uh, uh, difficulty finding himself as a writer, uh, a breakthrough is reached when he discovers the work of this Senegalese writer from the 30s, T.C. Elinman. And, and I know that that character was inspired for you by Yambo Olugem. So I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about his story, which is, it, it deserves to be more widely known, one of the most fascinating figures of Francophone letters of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, how did you come to know his story? And uh, Yeah, sure. Um, Jan Bolo uh, was a Malian author. Uh, he wrote in 1968. He was uh, 28 years old. His first novel, uh, Le Devoir de Violence, uh, which is translated now, uh, republished. Uh, but the title is Bound to Violence. And Bound to Violence is the metaphor of rise and fall. Wologam is the metaphor of rise and fall because he received, he won the Prix Renaudot in 1968. But three years later, uh, he was accused of plagiarism and uh, he wrote two or three other books uh, and then disappeared. He simply vanished like a Shakespearean witch. And, uh, uh, he, he, and um, he became, the legend says, I don't know, a um, marabou. Um, no. He's very mysterious. A legend, a black legend, an obscure legend started with, with him. With very many questions. Uh, why? What happened to him? Why this happened to him? Was it because he was an African? Uh, uh, were the accusation of plagiarism true or not? And of course, what is plagiarism? What are we talking about when we talk about plagiarism in fiction? Um, what about influence? Um, what about... Uh, Tributes. What about uh, just uh, paying your debts to other writers? Uh, this is the history of of, of Wologem, uh, and no one can, uh, with the certainty that it's the truth, say this is the 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 the, the truth about Wologem. No one knows because he remains silent. We just can have hypotheses. And the novel, one, this novel is uh, one of these hypotheses, but uh, in a fictionalized hypothesis. And when I, I met him when I was a, a teenager, uh, I, I had a, a teacher at that time in Saint Louis, and um, Saint Louis du Senegal, not Missouri, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, and um, that teacher was a friend of mine. And he gave me uh, a copy, a very legendary copy, because uh, he, he lost the copy and then he find, found it and uh, gave it to me. But the copy, uh, there were missing pages uh, or um, some, yeah. And, and I, I, I read it in that kind of epic condition. And uh, it was the beginning of my story and my fascination for the text above all, the novel above all, before discovering the fate and the man behind, um, the, 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 behind the, the, the book. But it's a wonderful book, uh, Bound to Violence, a great book. For, for a moment I thought you were saying you had met Olugem 
in person, uh, and it, it, it feels appropriate with your novel and, and the mystery of this writer that, that you didn't, in fact, but uh, still remarkable because I know the, the print run of the book was actually pulped at one point after the plagiarism scandal. So you've made the story a little bit more legendary and the book a little bit more rare, but it, it was difficult to find for, for many years. Uh, so I wanted to ask, so I, I did a little bit of delving into to your, uh, your beginnings as, as a writer when I was writing on the book, and I discovered that you had been a, a literary scholar in training uh, before you became a novelist, and that Olegem had been one of the writers that you, you researched and that you, you studied. So why was it that you decided to address the, the mystery of Olegem's story in, in fiction rather than uh, through, through scholarly work? Or, or did it j just seem more fun to be a novelist? Um, <laughs> the truth, the sad truth, is that I'm a poor scholar. <laughs> um, the sad truth is that I failed uh, in, my, in the way to my PhD. Uh, I stopped. Uh, Maybe because I, I'm a little bit lazy, um, <laughs> but maybe because it, the, the, the truth can also be that I'm just, I was, um, yeah, fiction was the, the deepest call, really. Um, I tried very hard to finish um, this academic work, but I felt that uh, Wologem's case mm, needed a novel mm, because the scandal, the Wologem's scandal, mm, started with a novel. And I felt that, uh, yeah, I had to, to write the, the novel because the novel gave, an fiction gave me just the more space for all the questions about holograms, but widely, more widely, about literature itself. Um, and that's why I stopped uh, the PhD. Uh, Sometimes I have more elaborate uh, explanation. I try to, um, to give some um, flamboyance to the, 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 the defeat. Mm and the fact that I gave up. Um, but yeah, I just think that um, it was my, my way. Fiction was my, 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 my way. Well, well, I'm sure a lot of very talented scholars wish that they could go your way with <laughs> these questions. Yeah, uh, that's why uh, relativism is a true thing. <laughs> Speaking of relativism, so, so one thing that's so compelling about The Most Secret Memory of Men, to, to me at least, is that it's almost like a, a nesting doll. Uh, we, we're, we're with Diagon and we're, we're searching for the story of Eliman, this vanished writer, and, and, and for his book, and yet we're always getting this story through others. Uh, so, you know, I love the way that he first encounters the book. Uh, he's, he's trying to seduce an older writer, this, this woman, Marem Sigadi, and he kind of doesn't impress her, and so she's like, you're a little too immature for me, but let's smoke a blunt together, and here's this very rare book that's gonna change your life. It, it's a, a totally unexpected way of opening it, uh, but it, it sort of becomes the first layer in just levels and levels and levels we have journalists who, who knew Eliman during World War II. Uh, we have people from his home village uh, and, and people who knew those people. Why did you create this kind of infinite regress where, where we can never really get to Eliman? Uh, why was that important to you rather than kind of creating a biographical character? Um, the uh, geometrical figure, uh, which is at the heart of the book, is the labyrinth. And uh, for me, and that's why I owe something deep to Borges, um, labyrinth is the most perfect 
phone to tell a story. Because uh, for the one who tells the story and for the one who listens to the story, or for the one who, who reads the story. Because uh, I just think that a labyrinth is a space for freedom. It's not a prison. It's for freedom. When you are in a labyrinth, it just means that you can go wherever you want. Uh, you can, of course, meet some um, dark places, uh, one way path. Uh, you can come back, try another way. But this is a form of freedom. And I love that form for a structure of a uh, novel. Basically, what I'm saying is that I'm very poor at drawing structures. And of course, when you choose labyrinth, that's very useful <laughs> in, 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 a, in, a, in a way for your book and for the structure of uh, a, 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 a book. Um, it's, it was important for me that Eliman existed in other characters' point of views. Because basically in life, I think that everyone exists in other one point of views. And I'm very, um, it's a, a matter for dreams, infinite dreams. The fact that uh, at this very moment, I can imagine, uh, I, know that I don't know how, how much people are, are here, but uh, everyone here has a, a piece of you or me living. And I, I want to meet that, that one, the other me, uh, and the life of, of all those others is a matter of for infinite dreams to me. And in a way, that's what I wanted for Eliman, a kind of a broken glass, but the fragments of the glass were so um, numerous that you can't catch them all. You just can catch a fragment and see what you, and see, look at the, in the fragment, in the mirror, in the small piece of mirror, uh, which is a small piece of Eliman's soul or faith, or truth. And that's why I, I, I tried to, uh, to, to, to structure the, the, the novel this way. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really engrossing labyrinth, and the question of who Eliman really is, it also connects in a way to the question of paternity and, and literary paternity. So, so Diagon is sort of looking for a literary father figure, and, and I know a lot of the young African writers in this book, uh, they are frustrated with what they see as their literary inheritance. They, they, uh, they have all kinds, as, as young writers do, they have polemics about their, their elders and how they feel that uh, their elders let them down in certain ways or, or maybe uh, shrunk the labyrinth in which they could operate. And Eliman, this mysterious vanished writer, becomes a sort of alternative tradition that is freeing because we can't say exactly what he meant or where he went after he published this novel. And, and I wanted to ask you about one decision you made when you, so, so Wolugwem published in, in 1968. Uh, and one thing that you do with Eliman's story is that you move it back to the 1930s. And I just wanted to ask you why you, just, you, you chose to, to make that shift in, in your novel. Yes, um, because uh, the, uh, in, the, in the novel, uh, Eliman's um, story, scandal books, uh, started in uh, 1938, so one year before the beginning of, the, uh, of World War II. And it was important for me to put that event, historical event, in the book, because the book, uh, I wanted the book to be uh, um, a journey, a journey through the 20th century, uh, a journey through the history of violence. And I wanted World War II to be here, uh, next to colonization, next to dictatorships in Latin America, next to contemporary uh, um, strikes in Senegal, for example. 
because for me, this is uh, in very different form and nature, kind of a, um, yeah, an illustration or a metaphor of the 20th uh, century. And I wanted Eliman to, 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 to go through the, the, the whole story. And um, there is a more perverse reason, uh, because I'm, I, um, in 1938, uh, the reviews of, African, of an African book offers a fantastic and horrific uh, panorama of, uh, of, of racism, of uh, uh, stereotypes, of prejudices. And of course, when you are a novelist, you can't miss that. In fact, that was one of my favorite part of the novels, the, the way you, uh, as, a, as a critic particularly, the way that you ventriloquize these, these 1930s French critics who, who are taking this novel by Eliban and trying to draft it into their case for or against colonialism, for socialism, whatever program that they have in mind other than literature itself, uh, which, which seems to me to be the, the sort of politics uh, there in, in the kind of undecidability of, uh, of Eliman. Um, so, so you were saying you wanted this book to be a, a journey through the history of, of violence in the 20th century. And, and it strikes me that it's also a, a journey through different literary styles. Uh, there, there's elements of folklore in, in Eliman's childhood. Uh, we have this World War II sort of archival drama, which involves excerpts from imaginary scholarship and, and critical articles. Uh, and then we have a contemporary satire. Uh, what did you mean by approaching this story through a sort of pastiche? Like I, I think of Wolleguem and what he was accused of and, and uh, the, the way that that could be interpreted as, as a mode of pastiche. Uh, why, why create such an anthology of, of styles? Um, for many reasons. Um, of course, you mentioned Wolleguem and um, there is a direct echo to uh, what he tried to do with literature, with text, with uh, the, the, the way he tried to just uh, put a text in echo to another text. And I wanted that, but in styles. I wanted uh, to yeah, open the form of the novel as much as possible. Uh, so that every reader can just find a way or choose a way and walk very freely. And uh, if someone, some reader, a reader wants to keep the uh, satire in the book, he can just choose that line and be, but other lines, other styles exist in the book and I are just mixed. And I wanted that kind of form. Um, it's related to what I said uh, before uh, about uh, chaos and labyrinths. Uh, it's, it's, it's related. One other reason could be Roberto Bolaño, because I really love Roberto Bolaño, and um, he, he reading him, discovering him uh, 10 years ago was a complete uh, metamorphosis for me. Something deep changed when I, when, I, when I read him. And Bolaño gave me many lessons, but the most important lesson from Roberto Bolaño was uh, the fact that uh, literature has to, to be playful. And being playful doesn't mean that you are not serious. Doesn't mean that you don't have a melancholy. Doesn't mean that you don't have a deep and profound sadness. Um, on the opposite, uh, the, the, I mean, playing, having a play, playful approach of literature can be uh, the most, um, or the highest, the highest uh, way to express your sadness or the sadness of literature or the sadness uh, in which every reader is um, merged 
when you read sometimes mm, it's the sadness uh, of just looking for something knowing that the something is here and knowing at the same moment that you will never find it, found it you never find it but that's literature and sometimes it goes through playing and that's uh, that the playful dimension was very important uh, for me and Bolaño uh, is a master uh, for me you have met, you you took your your title from a work of Bolaños and, and your epigraph and it, it strikes me as important also that Eliman he's we see him in Senegal and we see him in uh, France but we also see him in South America, in, in Buenos Aires, where in the 60s he meets uh, writers both real and invented from, from all over the world. And I wanted to ask why it felt important to you uh, to, to put Eliman in, in that context. Um, first of all, to just uh, underline the fact that uh, the African continent um, is not apart from history. In the 20th century, sometimes you can just think that uh, it was just in Europe, it started here and ended here, ended up here, and nothing else happened. But you can have African figures, and not only tirailleurs, I mean, not only soldiers battling, fighting, and dying here in Europe. You had also writers intellectuals being in contact and trying to build a global history. And it was important for me to put Eliman in that history and to put him uh, in a discussion with other great writers in a very normal way, not as an exception, not as something um, completely uh, incredible. It's normal. He is a writer, he met Gombrovich, he met Sabato, he met Victoria Ocampo and the other one uh, around, the, uh, around La Revista Sur, and they have a discussion. It's important, uh, they have something to say about their history, about literature, about their continent, uh, but above all about, about literature, it was important. The second reason is that, of course, uh, I love Latin American literature uh, because I just understood some parts of my own childhood reading Latin American writers, reading Borges or uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, Bolaño, of course. Uh, but Bolaño is different because, uh, yeah, he considered himself as a Latin American writer true Latin American writer. But we all, we all knew that he uh, spent almost half of his life uh, living in, in, in outside Latin America. Uh, but yeah, Borges, Sabato, uh, yeah, Cortazar, Roberto Aldheim, all of these great, great, great uh, Latin American writer were very important to me because they just gave me the opportunity to understood, and they are, this is a metaphor of literature, I, I think, to understand your own being by going uh, in a very far place from your own culture. But this far is just, uh, I don't, I mean, a mental uh, distance uh, deep inside, it's very close. To, to you, and that's why, and you understand it with, with fiction and with uh, literature. And, and there is this wonderful cosmopolitanism in the novel that, that goes beyond just Europe and Africa. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of anxiety about home in the book, and, and without giving too much away, uh, toward the end, Diagon returns to Dakar, where he hasn't been for, for many years, despite his, his parents' complaints. Uh, and, and he returns in, in the midst of a bit of a political crisis. And he, he becomes very anxious about the relationship between 
literature and, and politics. I, I believe a, a, a high school acquaintance of his says, you know, uh, white readers in France might care what you have to say, but what do you have to say about your country and what's, what's happening here? And that then becomes folded in with Elie Mann's disappearance and what did that mean? Uh, this anxiety about literature and politics, is, is that something that you experienced as, as a young writer? And, and how did you want to approach it in, in this novel? And, um, um, it's, it's always a, always a, a struggle, um, and what I mean is that um, some, sometimes I have the feeling that I have to justify every time um, facing some friends, some uh, compatriots, to justify um, my choices, my literary choices. Uh, my writing uh, to justify the fact that uh, I choose to go uh, in Latin America instead of staying in Africa. One of them <laughs> asked me once, uh, why did you choose uh, Gombrowicz or Sabat or uh, you could have chose Wole uh, Shoinka or Chinua Achebe. Why? And you have to justify and but by justifying, you, ha you are giving him credit in his um, judgment or prejudice. And the prejudice is always that you have to be very close to, uh, in your writing, uh, to your culture, with your culture. Uh, and that is not a rule. You can, but it's not a rule. And um, yeah, I try with fiction to escape prejudices or the uh, what people whether they are from your own culture or other culture expect you to write uh, and they are they based on your I don't know your your color of skin your culture your uh, your I don't know your nationality and all of these are create some expectation very strong and deep expectation and I always have to avoid that, uh, to escape that. And in that sense, it's a political statement. But going through fictions, going through novel, always. S speaking of those, those prejudices about what you, you ought to write, uh, is parody for you a, a way of clearing space in a way? I mean, this book has so much about the way that African literature is, is received in the West and, and you, you kind of take apart uh, some of the critical assumptions around it that, that affected Yambo Wolugwem's career, uh, but also in the contemporary world. Uh, and I, I wonder if that for you is a way of kind of clearing space for, for what you can say in, in the future. Yeah. Um, um, being ironic or creating that parody. Um, yes, it's a way to just say, uh, I won't be where you expect me to, to stay. It's just, just that. And of course, um, there's a kind of a, uh, self ironic, I, I mean, I'm <laughs> uh, when I was, yeah, six, seven, eight years ago, I was with friends. In the beginning, the, the, that, the, the group of young African writers being there in Paris, uh, uh, looking for the center, uh, having that relationship of love and hate with this question of center. This is part of my own story, of course. And when I look back, look back at those years, it's very, <laughs> very funny, very comical. It's a comedy, in a way. Being there in your own uh, um, feelings, uh, being very angry, uh, saying, I want to be recognized. Why don't they recognize me? Uh, look, they are giving the Prix Goncourt to this one. Uh, and, <laughs> and you are here. And, and yeah, so there is a comedy there, a pure comedy. So the condition to create the space to just say what you want is to see what you are 
actually, or what you were, where you come from, and to take lessons from the place you come from, just to have a kind of a, a lucidity uh, towards the other, but towards yourself first. And it's the only condition uh, to be, um, yeah, to, to, to be free, in a way, to be free. And novels gave me, fiction gave me the space for that, for humor, for autoderision, for that kind of uh, distance with all those problems. And in a way, just another way to, to, be, to be very close to them, creating distance to be closer, which is the equation uh, politically uh, uh, in, the, in the novel. In, in terms of pure comedy, I, I appreciated a, a rivalry in the book between this very serious young Congolese poet and this young Guinean influencer who writes a book called Love is a Cocoa Bean and sells millions of copies. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you, you get the sense of, of young people striving in a very narrow space, very defined from outside, but, but finding a way to build uh, solidarity nevertheless. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, we've said a lot about Yambo Wolugem. Uh, I wanted to ask you about another canonical writer from, from your own country, actually, um, who, who is a small presence in this book, uh, Leopold Sedal Senghor. And uh, who, who have, one thing that struck me as I was reading is, is you invent a writer of the 1930s, Eliman, who's a kind of iconoclast and, and uh, who, who is upturning everything that's expected of him uh, in a way. And, and the most prominent African writer at that time in France was Senghor. And, and I know he's also someone you've studied. So, so, so were you trying to create a kind of counter figure in, in Senghor's era to him? What's, what's your relationship to, to his work like? Um, yeah. Um, I will wait every word from now. Because uh, Sangor's uh, ghost is a very terrific one. Uh, um, and we're in a French consulate building, so he's, yeah. he's present. Yeah, yeah, in a way. And uh, Suleiman Bashir Gagne is somewhere in this uh, space. And Suleiman Bashir Gagne is uh, uh, the knight, the Sangorian knight. Um, <laughs> I don't want him to. Um, I love Sangor um, very much. I read him. I love the poet, of course. The political figure is more controversial, but the poet is absolutely delicious. Um, wonderful one. Um, and of course, with that kind of very heavy historic figure, uh, it's difficult to go to, 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 to start after them when you are a young writer or a poet. But you just have to admit that every country needs that kind of figure. Every country has that kind of figure. And they are important because they give you the opportunity uh, to just uh, take a position for, with, against, uh, besides. I don't know, you, you take your position and you continue. And that's why they are so important. That's why having a literary tradition is so important. Yesterday in Duke University, I was talking about the fact that um, in, in here, in, in, in America, in the US, you have that kind of um, infinite and exhausting debate about the, the, the great American writer or, or the great American novelist or the great American novel. It can be, I don't know, Moby Dick or uh, Seoro or um, Tony Morrison or uh, I don't know Faulkner. You choose, you choose, and you justify, and you you debate and you fight. Um, but it important. It, it just show that uh, in this country, yeah, it exists. The debate is here, and those figures just give spa give space for readers and for writers to just yeah, have some position and to start with that. There are starting points, and Sangor is one of those starting points, or at least important point in a literary uh, history. 
you can criticize him, of course. You can love him. Uh, uh, but uh, he is here. And it's important he is here. Uh, literally, I mean. In a literary dimension, you need that kind of uh, that kind of figure, and it's my relationship to to to, to Sangar. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, I love your poetry, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the ghost is placated, and uh, <laughs> what you said reminded me of one of your my, one of my favorite lines in your novel, which is about Eliman's work. Uh, that it's both a, a cathedral and an arena for, for young writers. And, and I think you yeah. really capture the way yeah. that a tradition can be overbearing in a way, but it also, through trying to cast it off, uh, people create themselves and writers create themselves. Um, this leads me into another question to go back to the theme of paternity in the novel. I, I don't remember when exactly it struck me, but so much of this novel is about you know literary fathers, uh, Diagan and Eliman, and then when we learn about Eliman's childhood, there's a question of who is his father? Is it this uh, you know, French patriot who died in, in the Great War, or is it this uh, Senegalese traditionalist? Uh, and yet, then it struck me that so much of this story is being told by a woman, by, by Marem Sigadi, who is sort of a Scheherazade uh, in between Diagan and the story of Eliman. And I read in some of your interviews and other books about the importance for you of, of sort of the storytelling traditions of, of women. And, and I wonder uh, how gender plays into the way you structure the narrative of this book. Uh, and, and if there's a, a way in which that sort of unsettles this question of what is the absolute origin, who is the father, the father ghost of, of African literature? Um, <laughs> women, in my history, my biography, are at the beginning. Uh, my love for fiction started with women in my family, uh, with tales. And tales are told by women uh, in, my, in my family. And uh, that's why I think that the fact that I discovered fiction through tales and very concretely through women's voices, my mother, my grandmother, aunties, and so on, uh, was extremely, yeah, a decisive point, of, uh, point for me, because um, uh, I kept those voices, and I think that uh, they are in all my novels. All female characters come from there, from the childhood, I think, and from the, those moments, I was just sitting here, sitting here, sitting there, and listening. I was sat there, and I was just listening to to the to the tales. And um, in tales, there is something. In the tales of my culture, I mean, at least, um, my grandmother used to sometimes to stop telling me the story, the tale, and engage a uh, kind of a dialogue, but a dialogue about the tale. I was listening. And he asked me, why do you think these character choose to do that? And you have to give an answer, uh, to give an hypothesis. It was a lesson, uh, a lesson about fiction, what fiction is. And she told she taught me to take the tale seriously as a living thing, something that impregnates your point of view, your heart. You have to decide or to, to, to think about it very deeply. And at the same time, when I think about it, I think that that moment of stopping the tale uh, was also a way I don't know if my grand grandmother would say, put it in that world, but I just think that um, it was the proof that a tale doesn't belong to the one who tells the story. <coughs> and in a way, it's a reflection about pa 
paternity, I mean, about authorship, the fact that you own the story you are telling. You don't own it. It doesn't belong to you. A tale doesn't belong to you. It belongs to a culture, a tradition, to history, to times. And uh, you are just the storyteller. Of course, you can play with it. You can change form. The same tale can have different form uh, from one evening to another. It's not a problem. And I think it's it's very uh, it was very important to have that um, lessons and and your tale w has, has so much energy that it, it's actually uh, created some changes in in your own life uh, and and for, for this part of it I actually want to invite uh, your publisher uh, Felween Sar to join us briefly on stage um, uh, Felween a, a uh, novelist and polymathic uh, intellectual in his own right. Uh, so I, I wanted to, to ask, for, so you're, you were the publisher of The Most Secret Memory of Men in Senegal, and you published it in, in, uh, with a, in collaboration with Philippe Ray in France. And I, I wanted to ask you how you first came to, to work with uh, Mohammed on, on his books. I think the first time I met him, it was through his uh, writings. He was a critic, and he, he had a blog named Chose Revue, and he was a very fierce critic. And I read his critics of you know books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and I, I said, okay. And the second time I heard his name was through Leonora Miano. She was in a jury of short stories, and she read the short stories he wrote, entitled The Lacal, who was talking about slavery. And he told me, you have a very young, promising Senegalese writer, so just watch on him. And, I, and before his first novel, I know him, because I know that he, because I read Lacal, and I was reading his, his critics on Show's Review. And I think we had a conversation when you finish your first book, before you send it to President Africa. I don't know if you remember, we had a conversation, a brief conversation on yeah. internet, on Facebook. And at that time, we were creating our house of publishing in Senegal, with Bobokar Boris Job, a Senegalese writer, and an Efsa Tudja. And we, were, and we created a publishing house in 2013, and the first book we published was a book of, uh, of Suleiman Bashar Diagne, here present, that was already published, and we had the right to publish again the book, Common Philosophy on Islam. And we, and we published a novel, La Play de Malik Fall, he talked about this morning. And after his two books, to Presence African, we had a conversation around his third book, and he decided to, to come, come join Jim San. It was a very delicate enterprise because the book talks about homophobia, homosexuality in Senegal, and uh, Senegal, is, I can say it's an homophobic country. So, 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 and so it was very, I would say, courageous from him to write his book and to talk about this question in, in the literary space. And we decided to work together. And I was friend with uh, Philippe Ray because we have already worked with uh, Suleiman. We have co published the book, book of Suleiman Bashir. And F Philippe Ray joined us and we co published the, uh, the Pure Zone. And after that, we co published La Plus Secret Memoir des Hommes. And when we had the first draft of the manuscripts, I think we felt that we had the extraordinary book here. And I think it, it took almost one year to walk around the, the different version and you know the end of the story. <laughs> Absolutely, no, there's uh, part of what's so great about this story is, is there's a sort of mise en beam going on where you, you wrote about this, uh, the story of Yambo Wolugwem and, and of uh, uh, African writing in French and literary prizes and Although you've made fun of this establishment and satirized it, you, you in fact won uh, the highest prize. Uh, good strategy. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, you, Felwin, you know, what it meant to you to be able to publish this book uh, in an independent Senegalese uh, publisher and, and what, how you felt when it received this honor. No, I think it was really unexpected and it was a very beautiful and amazing story because I've Ten years ago, when we decided to create this house of 
publishing, we felt that there was many talent in Senegal, West Africa, that deserve a close look and a good publishing of their oeuvre. And we don't have a publisher a lot, but I think the books that are in our catalog are, I would say, very good. And, and uh, where we started, because it was a kind of adventure, this Gonku Prize, I, I won't tell the story here, but it was a kind of adventure. At the beginning of the season in September, we were the outsiders, and at the end of the season, we were the favorite. And between September and October, a lot of a lot happened, and Mohamed became a figure. And at the beginning, I think no one would would uh, think or would you know yes, yes, bet on us. And and step by step, you know, things keep growing, 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 growing. And and I think at the end, you have at the same time the desire to have it for a lot of reason beyond him, you know, around African literature, francophone literature, etc. center, periphery, all this debate around the symbolic capital of writers, the place of African writers, etc. Et and, and as you mentioned, after René Maron, 1921, so one century after, he was the second black man or West African who have, so he was the first sub-Saharian, but he was the second black man who, who have it one century later. Century is a long time. Yeah, yes, it's, it, it's a very long time. So I think, you know, so there was at the same time those questions, but at the same time it, it was for us also a play. You know, we were serious, but at the same time not, you know, so, so I have this, so, so we discuss about, you know, you know, the different steps. And at the end, uh, I, I don't say how we say roulette russe in English. Russian, but Russian roulette. Yes, it was a Russian roulette because at the beginning of the season he was, on the list of 10 prices, but at the end, we could have the Gonko, but if we miss the Gonko, we, we could have no prices. And, and it was- uh, Fate so worse the, than death. Yeah, yes, absolutely. It, 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 it was that. And, 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 and we won it. So it means that a book by his strength, by his power, by the power of the imaginaries he bring in the book, could open space. You know, and I think it was a, a kind of also a democratic idea that someone with his hammer talent could really break the wall, open space, and we were very happy that the big, mm, the, the huge maison d'édition, Gallimard, Grasset, etc., etc., two little publishing houses, it was like David and Goliath, so won the prize. So, so it was also interesting come for us. And I, I know it meant a lot to a lot of Senegalese people, and. Uh, you, you received national honors, uh, and um, uh, another metafictional sort of aspect of the story, though, uh, is you know you were you were lionized, Mohammed, when you you won uh, <laughs> the the Prix Goncourt you, um, uh, at home. But at the same time, there was a little bit of controversy uh, with your third novel, De Puram, uh, about a, an extraordinary novel, which I believe will be available in English soon about a young professor and how he sort of runs afoul of homophobia in, in Senegal. So uh, it just struck me that, you know, as in Yambo Wologwem's story, you have a story of a, a big prize and then a large controversy that it landed you in. I, I wanna ask you how it felt to, to go through that uh, and uh, what it was like going back to Senegal after that controversy and after that great honor. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, thinking about it, uh, having, seeing the book creating such a, a no, no, bringing such a no, no to me and bringing me at the same time controversies uh, is uh, the perfect or the most logical um, fate for it, because uh, it just proved that uh, you don't write fiction genuinely. I mean, everything can contaminate reality from fiction, and uh, what we call the mise en abyme uh, can always uh, extend uh, in real life. It's not only in books or in novels that it happens. Uh, and for me, it's the 
the, 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 uh, the most joyful news of uh, our era, the fact that uh, mise en abîme can come from novels and go to reality and transform an author into a character uh, of his own novel. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, and in, in, in Senegal, um, the reception was uh, divided in a way. Much people were very happy. I have to say that many uh, had so much um, congratulations, so much, so much, so much, really. And I'm very grateful to that. But one part was a little bit, you know, okay, you don't know. Uh, you wrote the Purzam before the book before that one, so uh, yeah, you want the Goncourt. They, and they means uh, French people, give you the Goncourt because you wrote the Purzam, and the Purzam was a kind of a, an attack against your own culture. So yeah, uh, the former colonial country uh, are just, is just congratulating, he's just rewarding you from your, 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 your book. It was the speech uh, and some yeah and yeah it create that but it's interesting to witness to witness that because it's the, the topic one of the topic one of the main topic of the book and of course when you are a writer and you are, and you are a writer witnessing uh, your own book another mise en abim here it's completely it's it's yeah that it's wonderful you don't have to take it personally. That's <laughs> I always say that when you write a book, uh, don't take it too personally. Whether the reviews are good or bad, don't take it too personally. <laughs> Create the distance. Of course, you are happy when you read Julian Lucas uh, writing <laughs> a wonderful review. But don't take it too personally, even if it's the most I don't know, wonderful review. And if it's uh, an attack, the baddest review, don't take it personally. If you have controversies, don't take it personally. Because people express themselves. They are not talking about you. They are talking about their relationship to a book. Even if they attack you, insult you, they are expressing themselves. And what a controversy shows from people who attack you is just there. They just prove the fact that the book is all as well a mirror. And they are talking about themselves. It's a, a, an issue between them and themselves. Uh, I was in a joy at that time. I was so happy. Uh, I shared that happiness with Felwin, with my family friends. Uh, I'm not saying that I despise the critiques. I just witnessed them because it was interesting, because it said something deeper as well uh, politically. It just <coughs> meant that maybe in Senegal we have a country which needs some books, which needs literature, which need to have a conversation. Uh, with uh, writers from this country. It was my interpretation, maybe a little bit naive, but that's what I strongly believe. Um, yes, I want to just add something. When the book, when the Purism was published in Senegal, during three years, no controversy, and Mohammed had the opportunity to have a tour in Senegal and have conversation. And at the and I think at the beginning we were a little bit afraid of a controversy, but the controversy didn't arrive. And the controversy arrived when he won the Goncourt Prize. And it's very interesting because I think it's also a matter of recognition. When he was recognized, some think that, okay, probably there is something behind. And, I've, and, my, and my reading of this is that it came also from a place of a trauma. When someone is recognized from our spaces, obviously, he's not just recognized for his talent and his work. He must have sold his soul 
to gain this recognition. And it was a very interesting the day of the Gonku when he received the prize. So we had a lunch with the jury. And the jury asked me, they wanted to read La, uh, the Purism. They, they haven't read it. So I knew that the members of the jury didn't read the Purism before reading La Prisocat Memoirism. So, so no way to, you know, to, to, to just give him the prize because, because they didn't knew. I knew that, and I was hearing in Senegal those kind of story. But the, the timing is very interesting. It's when he gained some recognition that, that the political life, and I, for, 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 and, I, and I just think it's also an, a, a kind of expression of face of a colonial trauma. You know, this idea that some of us, if they are recognized outside, it's because, it's, it's not because that they are just good. You know, they have, they maybe have done something, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's because he's, I believe yes. one commentator said, you know, is in the pay of the LGBTQ lobby, uh, or, uh, and, and again, there's a parallel with, uh, Wologuem, just because you know he wrote a novel that was was critical of aspects of, of life in, in his country and was accused by many writers of of selling them out in a way before being embraced by by later generations. So it's um, it's a constant dynamic to that you have to navigate and that you've you've done quite courageously and uh, with with panache. Um, so for my, um, I think I want to close with a question uh, sort of about, uh, apologies if this is too, too general, but I, I, I think it's, um, it's so much at the heart of the most secret memory of, the, of men, uh, African literature in French. Uh, and so this is a book that was written in French, uh, but interwoven throughout, there's, there is prose in, in uh, Sarah, the language that you grew up speaking, uh, and there's also this anxiety when Diagon returns home. Is what he is writing, is what he's doing relevant to, to the politics in his home countries, to, to what, what young people are thinking and doing there? And uh, this, is be this made me think, I, I was reading the novel during this period when there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of skepticism around the, the French language in, in former colonies of, of France, and you know, Mali uh, j just struck fr French as their official language in their constitution. And yet, by the same token, or, or on the other hand, I've read by 2050, 85% of all French speakers may be in the African continent, which is, which is really remarkable. And so this too big question is sort of for both of you, the future of African literature in in French. Uh, what will, what is that going to look like, uh, given given these dynamics? Uh, do do you think we're going to see a turn uh, toward indigenous languages, or do you think there will be the French language will continue to be very relevant in in the countries across Africa? Why always me? Yes. <laughs> because you're the young guy. <laughs> said, said, said Mario Balotelli once. Um, um, <laughs> the future is bright. Um, uh, the, the future is bri bright uh, for both literatures. I mean, the one who will be written in French. Writers will continue, I think, African writers, Francophone African writers will continue to write in French. But uh, I also think that the future is bright for uh, literature in Wolof or in Serer or in other languages from, from Senegal. Uh, there is no opposition and um, I just take my own example. I, 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 one day, I'm sure, I'm sure that I will write directly one day in Wolof or in Serre. I will. I'm learning I'm how to write correctly in those languages because I speak them, but I can't. I can't write them because when I was in school, uh, I, I learned to write and to read in French. 
but I'm learning. It's a personal um, uh, effort, but I will. I, w I will. Uh, when I will just be here, yeah, I will be ready. I will try. And I think that other writers will. They, they, they will, and there will be no opposition. I don't believe in the fact that uh, uh, French is killing other languages. In the most secret memory of man, it's the, it's, it's why, that's why I, you have all these other languages uh, in the book next to French or under French, supporting French, uh, nourishing French in a way. Some images or metaphor, you can't understand them when you don't, when you are not a Wolof speaker, for example. Um, uh, for instance, there, there is a, a sentence in the, in the, in the book uh, where a a, a, a character say, uh, I will say it in, in French, um, qui passe où je suis passé sera taché de boue. Si me diar ko fa diar takaban, yagna, 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 et voilà, on rejoint les affaires <laughs> du, du grand Sangor et de, de notre aîné Souleymane Bachir Diagne. Mais voilà. When you are not a wall of speaker, you can't understand. You will just read the image or you just read the sentence. And maybe you can say, yo, that's strange. What does it mean? Okay, very stand, strange. What a poor sentence. But anyway, and you continue. But of course, you ignore because you don't know the other languages which are present here. And that's a way for those languages to continue their life. It's important. It's not just a decorative sentence. It means a lot, in a way. And that's why I think uh, the future is bright for both literatures. I think also that there is a strong desire of writing in African languages. And in Senegal, you have the Wolof of who are writing more and more in African languages. And I think also that it will grow but I think it also that uh, Muhammad and I, we had this conversation in Emory two days ago. Uh, we are very comfortable in writing in French because French have been our writing languages since the beginning. And we don't feel any conflict in writing in that languages. And what we, we were saying that it's also someone has to take into account the, the history, but also the biography of the people. How do the languages arrive in your life? You know, and how the languages arrive in your life is sometimes different from the his historical perspective. And you can be intimate, you can, be, you can feel at home in, in, in that languages because the languages arrive very soon in your life, normally without conflict, etc., etc., etc. And But probably the, 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 the deepest answer is uh, an answer from uh, Herman Melville, who wrote M Moby Dick, and when he was asked, do you write in English? Obviously, he was writing in English. And, and he said, no, I'm writing in, in outlandish. Outlandish means that he, were, he was writing in the language outside of his national languages. He was trying to write in his own languages. He was using the English, but he was writing Herman Melville. And I think the, the secret dream of all the writers is to write in their own writing in the Mbugarsar languages, writing in Suleiman Bashir, in Felwin's languages. And I think these dimensions go beyond the idiomatic common questions if I write in, in Wolof or in Serer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Julia. We have time for two questions from the audience. Hi, you talk a lot about um, reading Africa, uh, not reading Latin American literature, and what I'm personally really interested in, like, what are the connections between Spanish literature and Latin America and French literature in Africa? Do you think that there are? 
connections there and that those connections can be strengthened through literature? Yes, I think there are connections. Um, I'm not sure that I can give, uh, give you the, the, the strong, uh, I, can ha I can't have strong statement here saying, but personally, I, I, I told how uh, I understood some elements of my own culture or childhood by reading, uh, by reading, I don't know, uh, uh, Borges, for example, how I understood some political situation in some country, for example, in, uh, in Congo, uh, under, um, Mobutu, <laughs> uh, uh, under Mobutu, uh, when I read uh, um, Roa Bastos, Yo El Supremo. Be because, I mean, you, you it's not just a matter of, because I could say, it's, it's very, it's, it could be so easy to say uh, there is a connection about orality, you know, the fact that telling story uh, is important, telling them orally is important, uh, the fact that uh, the structure of telling stories is very different. Uh, from the uh, very classical European canon around the fact that uh, what we call, for example, uh, what some theories has called uh, magic realism is just reality in Latin America or in Africa, some countries of Africa and some countries of Latin America. We can't have all that connection, but you have to there are some just, here are some possibilities, but you discover the strongest connection, the deepest connection, because it, they echo to you in your history. And that's why I wish that everyone who wants to find, I don't know, relation or bridges, uh, just has to read both or to live in both uh, continent and to find what is possible uh, there. But through your own uh, and your personal uh, history. Hi, thank you so much for coming to Villa Albertine. Um, so I am a master student in French studies at NYU and one of the courses I'm taking is about representation of class struggle and, and labor movements in literature. And a question that we're grappling with is the question of literature as a historically elitist, racist, and classist form, can it be a tool of breaking down barriers and rewriting and not reproducing the same trauma and, and like um, the inequalities that have existed? So, thank you. <laughs> yes, probably I will draw on the answer he gave this morning at uh, Columbia University as, as novel as, a, as an organic space, uh, an, an organic space where d different types of genre that can be there, but also a place where people don't find you where you are when they try to assign you somewhere and you escape. So, so I, think also, I think the forms can be used to, to break down the hegemonies, to, to break down the rules, and to create a space of freedom and emancipation. Uh, I think that you, you can take the tool and, 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 and reverse the use of the tool. And all the tools you can reverse their use and, and probably come, writing and fiction is a, is a very powerful space where you can reinvent, create Ham Cosmos, and reverse all the tools, all, all the structure by the power of your writings and your imaginaries. So I'm deeply become conscious of, of that, that there is no, determinism or fatality of, re of reproducing through these gestures, you know, some kind of hegemonies. So you can totally re re reverse them. I, I totally think that the, uh, the, the power of creation and, 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 and the work through language is allow that. Thank you very much. <laughs> the books. And
And I would like, I would like you, I would like to thank Julian because it was a wonderful conversation. Really.